Well, church, it's good to see you here today. I always look forward to our time together in the Lord's Word on Sunday morning. Last night, Karen and I attended a uh, banquet for, that the Gideons put on for pastors every year, first Saturday in February. We haven't been in a few years, so we enjoyed being there. Uh, of course, the food was excellent, and that's always important. Uh, so we enjoyed that, and there were some uh, good testimonies, good time of prayer, and so forth. Uh, and there was some good music. Uh, Jonathan Wolf, many of you know him, uh, got up and sang a song and uh, didn't know what he was going to sing until he began to sing. Uh, and with the first few notes, if I recognized the song right away, uh, When God Ran. And we've heard that a few times around here. Uh, and he did a good job. Uh, uh, really enjoyed that. Don't tell Jonathan I said this. Okay? He did great. But when Blake and Tim and Jay sing it, it's better, okay? But they do a pretty good job, don't they? We enjoy them. Uh, so I'm glad to be here with you and to open our Bibles this morning. We're going through the first chapter of the book of Romans, and the subject is clear. It's the gospel. It's the gospel. So let's open our Bibles together and get your bulletin out if you would, turn it over. We'll take a couple of notes as we go along. We're going to look at uh, just a couple of verses this morning. Romans 1, 16 and 17. Asking ourselves, why are some people so devoted to the gospel? Is it worthy of great devotion? And here's what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Roman Christians in the first century. In verse 16, he said this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God for salvation to all who believe, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. So this is a letter originally that was written by the Apostle Paul to believers in the city of Rome, but ultimately it is a word from God to his church. That was just its origination. Now it is God's word, and it was from the very beginning. It's God's word to his people about his gospel. As I mentioned, the subject here is the gospel. And gospel means good news. So it's some kind of message that is considered to be good news. And Paul has already, in the first part of this letter, described what he means by the word gospel. All the way back in verse 1. He said that he was set aside for the gospel of God, verse 2, which God, uh, which God uh, proclaimed beforehand through his uh, prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And then he says in verse 3 that it's concerning his son. Verse 4 tells us that his son is Jesus Christ. So the gospel is God's. The gospel is proclaimed by God through the Old Testament, we would call it now, and the gospel is about God's Son, Jesus Christ. What about God's Son, Jesus Christ? Well, in verses 3 and 4, he tells us two things. Number one, that he was the seed or the descendant of David, King David, according to the flesh. And number two, that he was, that he was assigned to be the Son of God in power from the spirit of holiness at his resurrection. So he gives us two things that are very important here. The gospel is about Jesus, and Jesus is this one who is the son of David, the descendant of David, and so he's heir to the throne of Israel, and actually heir to all thrones, the throne uh, of the universe, it turns out, because he is also the son of God, and he was proclaimed... Uh, or uh, anointed and appointed to be the Son of God, not appointed to be the Son of God, but appointed to be the Son of God in power at His resurrection. He displayed a power that is unheard of and unknown at His resurrection. He defeated death. And so this is the gospel so far in the book of Romans uh, that, we have, uh, that we've read about. And so this is what Paul is talking about in verse 16 when he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. He's not ashamed of that message that is God's, that's about God's Son, about the fact that He is the Son of David, that He is the Son of God, and then that He has defeated death. But now He tells us more about the gospel. He tells us in verse 16 that it is also the power of God to salvation. 
the power of God to salvation. So it turns out that God's power is displayed in a message, in this gospel, this good news about Jesus Christ. And he throws this word out, salvation, for the first time in his letter, one that he will use again later, but he doesn't define it here. He doesn't tell us what he means by salvation in verse 16. As we read the rest of the letter, we'll find out. And if we've already read the New Testament, if we're already believers, then we should know what he means by salvation. But let's stop this morning and think about this and ask ourselves, what exactly is he focusing on here when he says that it's God's power for salvation? The one hint that we have already in the verses that he's written is the fact that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. That Jesus was resurrected from the dead. I wonder sometimes what people think Jesus is saving them from. What do you think Jesus is saving you from or wants to save you from? As a pastor, I've heard a lot of different ideas over the years about what people think God and Jesus are saving them from. One thing that we learn right away as followers of Jesus is that he doesn't save us from the difficulties in this life. He may empower us, and he does, encourage us, enable us, but he doesn't save us from the difficulties and the struggles in this life. Now, let me hasten to add that if we did not have Jesus in our life, there might be more struggles than what we face with Jesus. So we don't know for sure what he is, in fact, saving us from, but we do know this. He hasn't saved us from every struggle because we all have some struggles, some pains, and some suffering. So that is not what he's saving us from. Let's think for just a moment about what he's already said, that Jesus has defeated death. And so... One thing that we could say for sure in the context so far is that Jesus has defeated death and that God wants to save us from death. This is a profound truth, but it's one that presents a preacher with a quandary. And here's what the quandary is. Most people don't want to think about death or talk about death, if you sell life insurance, you know this. Nobody wants to talk to you. Who wants to think about death and dying? And so what we have done as a culture and as a people is we have come up with ways to not think about death. We avoid it. We avoid the subject. And surely, there's something positive about that. Who wants to spend all day, every day, thinking about dying? We couldn't live if we did that. And so there is something healthy about putting death in a category where it doesn't take over. But it's unhealthy if we make death something that we never consider, never think about, and never deal with. You see, our culture would like to say, well, death is just part of living. Death is just part of this Uh, a part of what this world is all about. It's the cycle of life. Things live and they die. Is that true? The Bible says that death is an enemy. Death is our enemy. And when God talks about salvation, he is talking about saving us from the greatest enemy that we face, the enemy that wants to take the thing that is most precious to us away, our life. We all know this. It spills out from time to time in popular culture. This week, we've seen an example of it. Last Sunday, I believe it was, there was a helicopter crash, and NBA great Kobe Bryant was killed along with his daughter, Gianna. Can't remember, 9 or 13 years old, just a young girl and some seven other people. In the outpouring of uh, love and affection and concern and consolation, Uh, over his death this week has been remarkable. That happens occasionally when someone who is beloved by people uh, all over dies, especially when they die we consider to be young. He was 41 years old. He seemed to have decades left 
to live and to enjoy his life and his accomplishments. And so this outpouring of affection and mourning and sadness over the death of Kobe Bryant this week is a reminder that we still know that death is the enemy. It's wrong for somebody to die. We don't want to die. We don't want our loved ones to die. You know, the fact is that death is that bad for everyone. There are 7 billion people on the planet today. If every time somebody died, we stopped and mourned their death like Kobe Bryant's death was mourned, that's all we would be doing. And so we have to move on. But we mustn't forget that death is the ultimate enemy. It wants to take away our greatest asset, our life. That's why we are pro-life as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why right now many of you are filling these milk bottles with change because you believe that that money can be used to save a life. And we believe that life is precious. Every single life is precious. Every soul is made by God, and he loves every soul. And that's why we're against death at either end of life or anywhere in the middle. Death becomes a difficult subject for some, especially at the end of life for some people, and I understand that. There are some times when people are in such pain and suffering that it seems like death is a friend. And sometimes families and medical professionals choose to embrace death for someone who is suffering beyond their ability to bear it and beyond the ability for family members and loved ones to witness it. But let's stop and think for just a moment. Death is not a friend in those circumstances. We've just redefined our terms. The reason that that person is struggling so is because the lake of death has broken the dam and it has come back into the, el the realm of life. It's a large chunk of death has already come in and taken over that person's life. And we see no solution other than to simply succumb and to capitulate and give up to death. Death is not a friend, it's just that death looks like it cannot be defeated. And then this Savior comes along named Jesus and says that he can defeat this great enemy that we have, death. That he can defeat the greatest enemy that we have. And to prove it, he goes to the grave and he defeats death himself. He comes back on the third day bodily, raised up, even though everyone saw him die a horrific death, knew that he was dead, knew that he was gone, knew that he was buried, and suddenly there he is again. He has the ability to save us from this horrible enemy who is taking away our life moment by moment, piece by piece, even right now, though we don't want to think about it. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of that kind of good news. That kind of good news that is the power of God for salvation. And notice what he says, for everyone who believes. Now, the emphasis there is not on belief. That will come in the next verse. The emphasis here is for everyone. Notice he says, first for the Jew and then for the Greek. For the, by Greek, he means all those who are not Jews. We could use the word Gentile. If you look back in verses 14 and 15, he makes that clear. He says that he is obligated to preach to the Jew and the Greek, to the wise and the foolish, to those who are in Rome. Whoever they are, wherever they are, wherever they come from, he is obligated to teach the gospel to them. This good news is not just for Americans. 
This good news is not just for white people or any particular ethnicity. This good news is not just for Westerners. This good news is for everyone, everywhere, no matter what color they are, no matter what country they're in, no matter when they live, where they live. This is good news for everybody, and that's the point here. And Paul knew that especially because he was the, he was the apostle to the Gentiles, to those non-Jews. So why is it to the Jew first? And then to the Gentile, the non-Jew, the Greek. Well, because of the promises that God made in the Old Testament. God has chosen first to make his promise to a man named Abraham. And then to pass that promise on from Abraham to his descendants, his family. And then to pass that promise on to his descendants as they became a people and as they became a nation. But the promise from the very beginning was that his descendant, Abraham's descendant, would be a blessing to all nations, to all peoples. When God began his promises to Abraham way back in Genesis chapter 12, he said, through your seed, all nations will be blessed. And so it comes to the Jew first because the Jew is God's chosen people, but they are, in a sense, a priesthood, a nation of priests, They were given the message, and they were meant to disseminate it to the world. Now that message is entrusted to the church, to us, and we are to disseminate it to the world. We don't just take the gospel and say, oh, I'm glad I've got it. We take the gospel and say, oh, I'm glad I've got it. I want everybody to have it. And so the gospel is at the heart of who we are as a people. Let's write something down on your bulletin. The first question, why should we put our pride in the gospel. Now notice in verse 16, really the, the main point is this. God, God, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of this gospel, which is about Jesus Christ, which is about salvation from the dead, which is for everyone, the Jew first and then the Gentile. I'm not ashamed of that. That's his main point, that he's not ashamed. Why would he even think that? Why does he even think to say something like that? What what motivated Paul to think that there would be any circumstance where someone should be ashamed of this good news? Well, his life experience taught him that. Because when Paul went to places and he began to preach and proclaim the gospel, there were people who wanted him to be ashamed of his message. And they used coercion to try to silence him and make him ashamed of his message. He found himself beaten. He found himself stoned. He found himself thrown into prison. He found himself run out of towns and locations. And so he knew that there were people who wanted him to be ashamed of the gospel. And the same thing is true today, church. The world wants us to be ashamed of the gospel. The world wants us to keep our mouth shut. Don't talk about Jesus that's private. Don't talk about Jesus. That's personal. Don't talk about Jesus because other people might believe something else. If you talk about Jesus, you might offend somebody. Well, if death is their enemy and they have no salvation, then we should risk offending them. Because offense means nothing compared to death. If speaking about Jesus makes them a little uncomfortable, we should risk being a little uncomfortable. How does that compare to death? If speaking to them makes us nervous, then we should risk being nervous. Because how can we compare a few nerves with death? And so Paul is saying here, no, I'm not ashamed. The world has tried to make me ashamed of the gospel, and it has failed. I am not ashamed of the gospel. But he's saying more than that, and many commentators point this out, that he's using really here a figure of speech. He's saying the negative, but he means the positive. And I believe they're right. What Paul really is saying here is not just that he's not ashamed of the gospel. He's saying this, I am proud of the gospel. I take great pride the fact 
that this message has been entrusted to me, Paul would say, and that I have the great honor of proclaiming to others so that they too can experience the power of God in their life, a power that even defeats death. So why should we put our pride in the gospel? Here's the sentence. It is God's only answer to everyone's greatest need. Now, that's such a big sentence that it would be easy to pass by it and miss it. I mentioned to you the quandary that a preacher has when teaching on a text like this. This text is about such big things that sometimes we may say, yeah, I've heard all of that before, I understand that, but right now uh, I have an illness that I'm dealing with. Right now I have a problem on the job that I'm dealing with. Right now my, my marriage is struggling. Right now I have a child who is in danger or a grandchild who's being misled. I have some, some things that I'm facing right now that I need to hear God on. I need help with these things. I understand that God's got the big things handled, but what about these little things? And I get that, and God gets that too. But there is a time that we need to stop and remind ourselves that God can handle all the little things, no matter how big they are. I'm not trying to trivialize them by calling them little. God can handle all the things we face because he can handle these big things. If God can handle death, then he can handle illness. If God can handle death, then he can handle our jobs, our marriages, our relationships. He can do it, and we should trust him to do it. Look what he says next in verse 17. He says, For the righteousness of God has been revealed, or we could say is being revealed, from faith to faith, just as it stands written, the righteous will live by faith. Now, when he says the righteousness of God is being revealed, he says it's being revealed in it. The righteousness of God is being revealed in it, it being the gospel. He's still talking about the gospel. He's telling us two things about the gospel this morning that we don't want to miss. Number one, it's God's power for salvation. He doesn't say it directly, but we're talking about salvation from death. Secondly, now he's saying that the gospel is a revelation of God's righteousness. The righteousness of God. What does that mean? Well, it can mean a couple of things. He could mean that God is righteous, that that's one of God's attributes. Everything that God says, thinks, does, plans, it's all right. It's all righteous. He never does anything wrong. He never does anything wicked or evil. God is in his nature righteous, and so everything that he does is righteous. That, though, is not what's being revealed in the gospel. That's revealed through the prophets. It's revealed through God's word. It's revealed in a lot of different ways. But the gospel is revealing something that happens between us and God. God who is righteous and we who are sinners. Who have, we've rebelled against God's righteousness. And so we're estranged from him. But this righteousness of God now is being revealed through faith. And here's the two things that are being revealed about God's righteousness. The first one is this, that in the gospel, God is willing to proclaim us to be righteous. To say, even though I am not righteous in myself because I have sinned, I have rebelled against God, the gospel is good news because God says to to me, Richard, in Christ Jesus, I am willing to proclaim that you are righteous. That's a big deal. You see, what that means is that God is willing to proclaim that I am right with him, even though I don't deserve it. Even though I have not earned it, because I haven't. Now, that creates a a problem, doesn't it? I mean, stop and think about it. If God is just and he is righteous, and he just comes along willy-nilly and starts picking people out who are unjust and unrighteous and saying, I proclaim you to be righteous. That makes him sound, it calls into question his righteousness. How can we say he's righteous if he will proclaim people righteous who are not righteous? I mean, what if these people have committed murder or they've raped 
where they've stolen and destroyed other people's lives, and you're saying that God is going to come along and he's going to proclaim them righteous? It doesn't seem right. There must be more to it. And there is. Not only does he proclaim us righteous, but he begins at that very moment when we're saved through Jesus Christ and faith in Jesus Christ, he, begin, he proclaims us righteous at that moment, and then he begins to work in our life to make us in reality righteous from that moment forward. Now, every one of you who are here this morning, you're my brother and sister in Christ, you have this process happening in your life, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This is the arm wrestling match that God introduces into our lives. You know, before we were saved, when we were sinners, many of us were just kind of dumb and happy. Just going along, sinning, having a good old time. Had no idea that anything was wrong because we accepted everything that the world said. Yeah, you'll die somebody, someday, but everybody does. No big deal. It's just part of life. You know, you just have as much fun as you can now and don't worry about it. And then God in his grace came and proclaimed this message to us, this gospel. And the gospel comes at first and it starts talking to us about death again. And we're like, death? I've learned not to think about that and talk about that. Why are you disturbing me? And it does disturb us. It begins to churn on the inside. And we begin to realize that something is wrong and we've been ignoring it. And more and more we realize that there's a problem that needs to be solved and and that it has to do with our relationship to God. Not just that we need a new life, but we need a new standing with God. And the gospel says you can have that new life through the gospel and you can have that new standing with God through the gospel. He will proclaim you righteous and he will make you righteous. Now, all of a sudden, you know what? In many ways, my life just got more difficult than it ever was before. Because it was easy before. I just went along with the sinners. Now, I'm fighting the sinners. I'm fighting the world. I'm fighting the devil. I'm fighting my flesh. And I even find myself fighting God. Because God's trying to make me righteous faster than I want to get righteous. I'm saying, slow down a little bit. There's a little sin out there that I still want to enjoy. And he says, why? What's wrong with you? I have fights everywhere. Harm wrestling even with God himself as God's Holy Spirit tries to change me from glory to glory into the image of Jesus Christ. But here's the good news. Life may be a battle as a Christian, but I want you to hear this. It is a winning battle. We have the victory. And it may look like the people in the world aren't fighting anything, that they're just getting along and going along and everything's good for them, but I'm telling you, they're on their way to destruction. There is no victory at the end of that pathway. Jesus made this clear. He said, yeah, it looks like an easy pathway. It's broad and it's smooth and everybody's on it. And this one over here looks rocky and it's, and it's, uh, it's narrow and it's difficult, but this one leads to life. This one leads to life. So we get on this rocky path and we follow Jesus to life. Now he says it's by faith and that's important. Did you notice that in verse 17? He uses a sort of an enigmatic phrase here that people struggle with from faith to faith. The NIV has changed it uh, to something like this. It's by faith from beginning to end or from first to last. That's really a pretty good way to think about that. It's not a literal translation Literal translation would be from faith to faith. Those are the actual words that are used. But what the NIV says here really catches the idea that this gospel, this power of God, this righteousness of God, from beginning to end, from first to last, top to bottom, inside and out, it's all by faith. There's nothing else we can do but put our faith in God. We have to trust him. We have to trust him. We can't work and get it. We can't be good enough. We're not going to impress God with all of our good deeds like a lot of people think they're, they're going to because that's what the devil's telling them. Hey, look around. You're as good as everybody else. In fact, go down there and look at that church. You're better than half the people in there, so you're going to be okay on judgment day. Don't believe a thing the devil says because that's not the way judgment works. You want to know how judgment works? Come tonight. We finally made it to the great white throne judgment in the book of Revelation in chapter 20 at 6 o'clock right here. We'll take a look at it. What's really going to happen on Judgment Day? Well, it's not going to be about impressing God with all of our good works. God's made that very, very clear. It's about faith. He ends this text with a quote from Habakkuk 2.4. Habakkuk was an Old Testament, uh, Old Testament prophet who lived about the same time as Jeremiah. 
And Habakkuk looked around at the world and he said, you know what, God, your people are pathetic. I'm paraphrasing. Your people are pathetic. Look how unrighteous they are. Why don't you discipline them? And God answered. Habakkuk was a complainer, by the way. So Habakkuk complained. And God answered his complaint. He said, I'm going to. And Habakkuk said, well, that's good news. How are you going to do that? And God said, I've already got it worked out. Have you heard of the Babylonians? And Habakkuk said, yeah. Why do you bring them up? And God said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring the Babylonians in, and they're going to discipline my people. They're going to destroy Jerusalem. They're going to destroy the temple. They're going to carry them away, uh, and the land will be, will get it to rest. And Habakkuk said, put on the brakes. Wait a minute. Here's complaint number two. Now, I know I asked you to discipline your people, but how can you use the Babylonians to discipline the Israelites? They are more unrighteous than the Israelites. I thought the Israelites were bad. These people are double pathetic. That can't be right. And God answered him, and he said, Don't worry, Habakkuk. Don't worry, because I will discipline them also. So Habakkuk has this fascinating little conversation with God, and he ends it with this idea of faith, that we have to trust God. And so he wrote in Habakkuk 2, verse 4, he says this, the righteous one will live by faith. Now, that can be taken a couple of different ways. It could mean that we live our lives now by faith, and that's true, but that's not really what Paul meant by this. What Paul means by this is that the righteous ones, those of us who have been proclaimed righteous by God, by the gospel, through our faith, we will live. We will live. We will live in heaven with God where there is no more death, sorrow, suffering, sighing, none of that stuff. That is the life that we will have because death has been, complete, death has been uh, destroyed by, for us. Death has been destroyed. It's going to be set aside. There is a new world that is coming where there is no death. Those who go to hell will exist, but they will not live. Life is something special. Life brings peace, prosperity, joy, rejoicing, worshiping, serving God. That's life. And when we're doing that here, we experience that. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. You see, tonight we'll see that there's something called the second death. We all talk about the first death. And as I've been talking about death this morning, you may have been thinking about the first death, the death that everyone dies physically. But there's something in the Bible called the second death the second death. And those of us who belong to Jesus Christ will never experience that second death. Even though we may walk through a physical death, it will be a step into life. A step into life for us. So here's the second sentence this morning. Why put our trust in the gospel? Why should we be proud of the gospel? Why should we put our trust in the gospel? Because it is God's only avenue to being right with him. It is God's only avenue avenue to being right with him. Remember, the Jew and the Gentile, everyone. This is politically incorrect. It's wrong to get up in our world today, especially in the West, and say that there's only one avenue to God, but that's exactly what the Bible says. That's exactly what Jesus says. That's exactly what God says. Don't be fooled by the world. God has laid out one avenue to be right with him, and it's faith in Jesus Christ. Church, don't be ashamed of the gospel. We are about to start another uh, semester of personal evangelism. In June of this year, Karen and I will have been here for 19 years. Every year, twice a year, we have done a semester of personal evangelism. And uh, as I think about the people in our church and look out uh, across your faces this morning, many, many of you have been through personal evangelism training. Uh, Many of you have been through it more than once. If you don't know what it is, it's very simple. We get together for about seven Tuesday nights in a row up here at the church. 
uh, we talk for a few minutes and then we go out into the neighborhoods of Camden and we knock on doors and we look for people that we can tell the gospel to. And God always gives us opportunities to share the gospel. But listen carefully. And you know this already, and I'm going to admit it. God always also puts us in positions with people who don't want to listen to what we have to say. So if you want to share the gospel, listen carefully to this. If you want to share the gospel, you're going to have to put up with some people who make you feel foolish. If you want to avoid people making you feel foolish, you will never share the gospel. Those are the two choices. If you want to share the gospel, you're going to look like a fool sometimes. If you want to avoid looking like a fool, then you'll never share the gospel. Now, I'll be the first one to say that I don't like that. And I have pleaded with God to change that. I asked him years ago. I said, look, you know who's going to be saved? I don't. Just tell me who's going to be saved. I'll go right straight to them, and I'll share the gospel with them, and we'll avoid all that other stuff. And he refuses to allow me to do that. He refuses. He wants me to tell the gospel to everyone. You see, I don't know who's going to be saved. Some of those people who try to make me out to be a fool might be some of the ones who actually end up getting saved. I don't know. God can see their heart. Now, we're going to do something special this time. It's a little bit different for... 18 years, we've done what I would consider to be a, a, uh, a beginner's version of personal evangelism. At times, we've talked about more intermediate and advanced things, but for the most part, what we've trained or talked about is, is a, a beginning version to take people who are not used to talking to people about, others about the uh, salvation that's available through the gospel and just learn how easy it can be to do that. One time since I've been here, we did a semester that I called an intermediate class where we looked at some more advanced options for, selling, uh, for sharing the gospel. And this time, uh, this semester in the spring, we're going to do that again. This will be only the second time that we've done this. And so here is the clarion call that I'm making this morning. For all of you who have been through personal evangelism class one time at least, you need to come back and go through the intermediate class and learn the next level of sharing your faith. For all of you who have been through once, at least, you need to come back and learn the next level of personal evangelism. So, uh, those of you who are saying that have never been through, you're thinking quietly to yourself, I can get away with this for one more semester. Sorry, wrong. If you've never been through personal evangelism class, what you need to do is sign up and come and I'll let you watch. You can get on a team with someone who's done it before. You don't have to say a word. You may be required to pray for that person, but you can just watch and see, begin to learn what it means to talk to somebody about the gospel. Now, I think there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer. If there's not, there will be one soon. So you go ahead and sign up and get ready. We'll start, I believe, the last Tuesday in February. Let's pray together. Would you bow your heads? The gospel. What does the gospel mean to you? How devoted to the gospel are you? Are you ashamed of the gospel? Are you not ashamed of the gospel? The text this morning really challenges us. When the gospel changes our lives, we want to see other people's lives changed as well. So, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I challenge you this morning. Share the gospel. Tell others about Jesus. If you don't know how, learn how and do it. Sharing the gospel with others will strengthen your faith. You may run into some difficult situations, and it may seem like at first that it's doing the opposite, that it's shaking your faith. But that's God working in our lives. When you tell other people about Jesus, your faith will be strengthened. Do you want your faith to grow? Now, if you're here this morning and you've never received the gospel, I want to challenge you to come forward today and, and pray with me and make today the day of salvation. If you need to be saved, you need to know that you have victory over death, that you need not fear death, that the second death has no authority over you, 
Because Jesus is your Savior. He died for your sins. You're forgiven. You're right with God. If you want to know all of those things, embrace all of those things, have those things for yourself, then I'm going to ask you to come forward and let me pray with you so that you can be saved and baptized and follow Jesus. And whatever God is saying to you this morning, maybe you need to join the church, do that. Come forward and let's do that. Father in heaven, we thank you for the gospel. Let it be alive in our lives every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Tim.